Welcome back, everyone. I can see that we are still quite a lot. So thank you very much for, uh, for coming back after the what I hope was a really nice break. After uh, a, a morning fully packed with uh, really interesting presentations, as well as lively discussions um, around the topic of health and uh, urban forests or um, green spaces. Um, and I hope you're re energized for another really exciting session. Uh, my name is Christiane During. I work for the European Forest Institute here in Bonn. Um, and amongst other things, I also work on the Clearing House project. So um, now we have an exciting session where we use uh, other projects um, and look at how they look at the sort of this interface between health and, um, and nature. Um, before we start, I would just like to remind you to use the Q&A function for any questions you have. In total, we will have seven presentations, and after each of them, we will have time for about one or two questions to the presenters directly. And then at the very end, if we've got more time, we can, uh, we can ask a few more questions. So then, uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Um, which is Annabelle Sir, who will introduce the uh, project Green for Care to us. In fact, we've heard um, about Green for Care this morning just very briefly in Matilda's presentation already, but um, Annabelle is going to give us some more detail. Annabelle recently joined the EFI team as a research trainee in the Resilience Program. She holds a Master in Landscape Architecture and is specialized in urban forestry, which is why she will support the Green for Care team um, and the program over the upcoming month. Annabelle, your presentation. Good morning, everyone. This is Annabelle Soer from the European Forest Institute. And today I will present Green for Care, um, a project funded by the EU focused on green, th green for health and social inclusion. Um, so our project arose from the clear need for business training to be applied in the fields of green care. And the purpose of the project is to contribute to the development of green care entrepreneurial opportunities. And we do this for students, researchers, uh, professionals, but also for practitioners to promote nature based solutions for human health, um, as well as well being and social inclusion. Uh, so there are four thematic sectors to this project, namely forest based care, social agriculture. Uh, green care tourism and urban green care. And the project works in three very simple steps. Uh, the first one being uh, to join our network, join our alliance. Uh, whether you are an entrepreneur and you already have an initiative, you can sign up through our website greenforcare.eu. Or if you have a scientific background, you can also join our alliance. Um, step two is learn. Uh, we provide training and support for professionals and students to develop and grow their ideas. Um, more information on that you can also find on our website. Uh, we have some reports and fact sheets for you there. And the final step is to practice. So obviously ideas alone are nothing without practice. Um, and therefore the project will also offer different programs of highly innovative, innovative activities. Um, that can help turn your green care theory into practice. And some examples of those are um, this year planned the Business Innovation Challenge and planned for next year the Highly Specialized School and the Hackathon Challenge. Yeah, so finalize this presentation. Sorry for the very quick and brief presentation, uh, but there's only three minutes. Um, but green is caring, so come and be part of a greener and healthier future, I would say. Uh, yeah, sign up to our network, uh, to our newsletter, and you can also follow us on Facebook and ResearchGate. Uh, yeah, and if you have any questions or comments, please reach out to me on my email address, annabel.soer at efi.int. Uh, my name is Annabel Soer. Thank you for your attention today and I wish you a good remainder of the urban forestry days. Bye bye. Thank you very much, Annabelle. Um, I don't know if you are currently online. I haven't seen any questions so far yet. Um, 
maybe there will be some at the very end. Um, so, oh, there you are. <laughs> um, we, we'll, we might come back to, to with questions back to you later. Uh, maybe for now, I already introduce our second speaker, um, uh, who is Dr. Tiger McIntyre, uh, who will introduce the project Green uh, Go Green Roots to us. Uh, Dr. McIntyre is an assistant lecturer in environmental psychology at Maynooth University, investigating cognition, well-being, and human nature interactions. He has published widely on topics including cognition, mental health, and well-being, and most recently on nature-based interventions. In 2019, he co-edited Physical Activity in Natural Settings with Dr. Ayofi Donelli. He is a member of the advisory board of the H2020 NBS project Renature, the Interreg project CCAT on coastal citizenship, and is a visiting lecturer at the Technical University of Munich. He is also the coordinator of Go Green Roots, a four-year project on urban health, which targets six European cities and has a global outreach with its 40 partners. Um, Tiger, your presentation should be right now. Thank you. very inspiring um, uh, presentation, a few familiar um, cities at the start. Um, I can't see any direct questions yet, but I actually do have one for you, Tiger. Um, I was wondering if throughout the project, um, have there already been any sort of outcomes, any, any data that you find um, surprising, something you, you, haven't you didn't expect before? 
Um, yes, because we've actually engaged in COVID related research, which certainly resonates with the voices we heard earlier. Um, so we have secondary data and we also have an, a survey uh, in one of the cities, um, which is actually with Renature, uh, another Horizon project. So we're certainly inspired by the voices of the citizens um, and how that echoes and resonates across the cities in terms of this what we perceive, and we will have a rev review out on it shortly, is shift to, na to natural environments for mental health and increased nature connectedness. And, you know, forests, to be clear, are actually at the heart of what we do. One of our cities is Lati, European Green Capital, where they have urban forests and we're working with them on that. And uh, Limerick City within Ireland, where I am um, at the moment, it's uh, certainly interested in using an urban forest to provide inspiration uh, to citizens about uh, nature connectedness, biodiversity. It almost becomes a natural lab in a way for people to understand, you know, what we call the principles of metamorphosis, homostasis and resilience, which are commonalities between human and environmental health. Um, we might come back to you as well with further questions from the audience uh, a bit later at the end of this session. Uh, for now, thank you very much. Thank you. And um, I'll immediately go over uh, to the next one. I have the pleasure to introduce to you Eric Anderson, who will be presenting the Enable project to us. Um, Eric is an associate professor in sustainability science. He has a background in landscape studies, natural resource management systems and landscape ecology, geography, urban studies, participatory research and transdisciplinary research and facilitation. Eric's core interest is in understanding interactions between people and nature, what shapes them and what they mean for people's well-being and worldviews, as well as for resilience and ecosystem integrity. Other than research, Eric has 15 years of experience of working in the interface between academia and the wider society, and he has led several larger European projects, including Enable, investigating broad sustainability issues. Eric, over to you. The project Enable set out to improve our understanding of one main question. Under what conditions does green and blue infrastructure actually deliver benefits? Recognizing the unique character of place, location and situation, while still striving to elicit universally relevant knowledge, Enable developed a suite of different tools and approaches for assessing and analyzing current conditions as well as scenarios of different futures. Central to all of these is a recognition of the importance of context, something that is often shunned as noise in science and research. Taking a systems approach to green and blue infrastructure and the ecosystem benefits that urban residents receive from it, we showcased three critical variables, what we called filters, that influence the realization and distribution of benefits from green and blue infrastructure. Infrastructures, the composition and configuration of the urban landscape itself, the integration of green, blue and grey infrastructure, institutions, land tenure, rights, rules and norms, and user perceptions and capacities such as people's diverse individual preferences and shared or conflicting norms. At the operational level, Enable created an assessment framework and develop new analytical tools and approaches for evaluating green and blue infrastructure performance as embedded in the three filters. It describes the different ways people are involved in realizing final benefits from green and blue infrastructure and thus highlighted the need to seriously engage with a range of justice issues. It investigated physical, mental and institutional barriers hindering equal access to desired green and blue infrastructure benefits and it used multiple evidence-based integrated knowledge to challenge multi-level governance responses, strategies, and arrangements. At a strategic level, Enable improved the understanding of citizen perceptions, preferences, and regulatory and cultural values of green and blue infrastructure and biodiversity, focusing on more than humans and reciprocal linkages between people and nature in cities. It identified potential means 
for integrating new knowledge and information, for example, on citizen perceptions and values in municipal planning processes. It examined critical fair and complex success factors to improve the analysis, design, management, conservation, performance, and assessment of multiple benefits of green and blue infrastructure. And it developed frameworks for addressing change over time. And it advanced the analytical and theoretical linking of urban ecosystem services to environmental and social justice and developed frameworks for exploring resilience, justice, tensions, and synergetic opportunities within complex and dynamic urban systems. And finally, in practice, Enable achieved to foster scientific co-creation, tailoring urban, social, ecological, technological research, and hopefully solutions to city needs, and informed policymaking and the development of policy options at the city level and manage this the systematic integration of citizens and experts knowledge and finally it strengthened the capacity for reflective practice and internal learning and it helped us track and document learning and impact thank you thank you very much um i have seen that you have said uh, you can also answer questions uh, afterwards um of course as now um i actually in fact uh, already have a question for you as well um I've, I, as i've said earlier you you have been working in um well with wider society for 15 years i was wondering how uh, well if and if yes then how um people's perceptions if, if you can say how people's perceptions have changed as of, over the last 15 years or how your work with a wider society has changed in these <laughs> days people are much more well, people recognize the multifunctionality of green spaces and the introduction of ecosystem services and the use of that language has helped opening up a broader discussion about the benefits of green space and how you can use nature-based solutions, urban green infrastructure, urban forests in more strategic ways in cities. So I think it has made the green aspects of cities more functional and uh, it has shifted over the years to include them more in the general urban planning from being a special interest maybe for conservation and certain groups. It is now better mainstreamed into uh, urban planning and general urban sustainability. Thank you very much. Um, I will um, go on and introduce the next speaker, who is Michael Gerard Lorenzen, and he will uh, present the project Dr. Forrest to us. Uh, Michael is a plant ecologist interested in the functional role of biodiversity, which is asking questions like, does biodiversity matter for the functioning of ecosystems? More recently, Michael enlarged his research field by studying the significance of biodiversity for human health. He is a professor for geobotany at the University of Freiburg in Germany. Michael, over to you and your presentation. Increasing evidence shows that spending Bear with us one minute. Increasing evidence shows that spending time in a forest environment has a positive impact on well being. Foraging for food, sheltering on a hot day, breathing in fresh oxygen, or simply taking in the visual and auditory beauty of the environment. But the question is, how does diversity of trees have a positive impact on our well-being? The Dr. Forest project has been set up across five key sites in Europe to quantify the impact of biodiverse forests on human health. Does it matter to human health if the forest is more or less diverse? And could biodiversity decrease negative health impacts? Do dilution affect natural enemies and canopy complexity lead to decreased health risks? The Dr. Forest project aims to answer these questions and many more 
to engage decision makers in managing forests in a way that promotes biodiversity and human health benefits. To assess visual diversity and its effects on mental health and well-being, photographs of forests of different species richness were taken in 2020. Currently, participants are sorting these pictures to identify visual differences between forest stands. A similar methodological setup will be applied to forest soundscapes. We hope to start the EEG lab studies in autumn 2021. Effects of forest diversity on microclimate are assessed using small climate stations. They've been set up in all the Dr. Forest sites to record the most important variables for human thermal comfort. The potential harm to humans produced by particulate matter and pollen could be reduced by higher diversity forests. To test this, large numbers of pollen and particulate matter traps will be set up this year. Currently, all trees are being inventoried to determine their heights and stem diameters. This data will be used to estimate canopy roughness and its role in particulate matter capture and filtration. A study designed for a multi-sensory forest walk is being prepared across several urban forests in order to assess effects of tree species diversity on mental health and well-being. This will help us to compare in-situ multi-sensory setups in real forests with the single sensory exposures to biodiversity in the lab. With results from this work, we will integrate each forest health pathway into one large synthetic model called a Bayesian belief network. This will allow us to detect potential trade-offs or synergies between different pathways. Although postponed by the pandemic, we will also engage stakeholders on this issue. Consortium members participated in several events already, for example, where they engaged in discussions about the development and management of a local spa and their healing forest. A dedicated workshop with stakeholders from professions of policy, research, practice is planned for June 2021 in Germany. Stay tuned for more updates and follow our blog and social media channels. We've in the meantime received a question for Eric, but we'll we'll answer that at the end of the sessions when we might have a few more questions as well to everyone. Um, so uh, for now, I would like to then introduce the next speaker, who is Katrina Kilpi. She will actually introduce to us uh, or have two presentations for us. Um, the first presentation will be on the topic of forest bath and resilience path. And her second presentation will introduce the International Forest Therapy Days to us. Uh, Katrina works at the interface of research and practice of nature-based well-being. She is partly employed by the Belgium-based forest advocacy organization Boss Plus, where she engages in forest and well-being related projects such as Clearinghouse and Dr. Forest. Under her nature-minded consultancy, she collaborates with experts from multiple domains to conduct applied research on nature experiences and to create mindful nature-based solutions. She is also the co-starter and organizer of the International Forest Therapy Days. Uh, Katrina, I can tell from experience that you, are, uh, as an attendant, that you put a lot of passion into the organization of the IFT days. Um, so I'm very, very eager to, to hear your presentation on that, but likewise um, on the other presentation. So um, over to you and thank you. Nature Minded has been looking for ways to integrate nature into everyday life in a mindful manner that strengthens nature connection since 2016. With a special focus on forests and their healing qualities, with nature we create solutions to fight stress, improve resilience and increase meaningfulness. Convincing public officials and society at large of including nature in our everyday lives has not always been easy. To do that, interdisciplinary thinking is needed. Luckily, Nature Minded can rely on the like-minded collaborators, experts from different fields who advise on Nature Minded projects. Nature Minded seeks to bring forest bathing to the people, guided and unguided, individually and in groups, indoors and outdoors. The Japanese gift to the world, Shinrin Yoku, means to connect with the forest with one's senses and to experience more consciously the healing and restoring effects of the forest. Together with the SAM health insurance provider and province of Eastern Flanders, we have created two well-being paths that provide a forest bathing experience. The concept is simple. You walk the trail that has been sprinkled with invitations that seek to engage the walker with the surrounding nature. As the walker goes on, the well-being effects of being in the forest are intensified, the walker relaxes and has the ability to engage in introspection. 
The effects of walking the trails were studied and the results are promising. People who walk the trail experience themselves less stressed, in an improved mood, feeling more focused and more alive. Equally important was the fact that strategically designed forest bathing trails slow many avid walkers down to a pace that keeps them enjoying the healing surroundings of a forest for a longer time. Concentrating on the invitations, on the other hand, helps walkers to experience nature even in a more challenging surrounding with lots of human-induced aspects, such as sounds. The well-being trails can therefore prove to be useful in Flanders, where the forests are small and fragmented and silence is a scarce resource. What happens if you go out to enjoy nature for at least 30 minutes a day for 30 days? The studies of this 30-30 campaign confirm the research results from large-scale international research, but furthermore nuance the fact that even nature enthusiasts need a boost to get outside that weather can be a real motivation killer, as well as the lack of company to get outside with. Our research highlights the need for nearby nature places, as people who have to travel further to get to nature tend to drop off the campaign faster. There is a lot of work to be done, but keeping nature in mind, we can't go wrong. That was already uh, really nice. I feel a bit calmed down now. <laughs> but we'll have the next presentation immediately after, which is on the Urban Forest, uh, forest Therapy Days. International, uh, sorry, International Forest Therapy Days. Like many other events last year, IFT Days was also moved online. The event was successful, even if it shrunk down from six-day event to two days of meeting, and we had to miss our crucial component of meeting face-to-face. -face. In the previous years, IFT Days consisted of a seminar day where state-of-the-art research and results were shared by international scientists followed by a workshop day which gave the opportunity to taste different practices from around the world and finally four days of immersion in a smaller group to nurture our community and our own nature connections while deepening our knowledge and experience in different practices. During this year of uncertainty we focus on supporting our growing community with monthly online gatherings and listening to what is living in research and practice of forest-based well-being. In 2022, we hope to come together again with new and old forest friends in a beautiful forest-rich location. You are welcome to join us. Which you, which you partly answered already. I was wondering how you feel how the um, well the inability to actually meet face to face has, has impacted the the um, the forestry uh, therapy days um, last year. Um, I was an attendant, but as I said, I could just um, you know join online. And um, I was wondering how how do you feel about it? How how did it go? Um, and I apologize for the noise they're making street works on on right, <laughs> but. Um, 
Yeah, uh, from those people, we've had people who came for the first two years and they were really, uh, they were sorry that they could not be there, of course, but um, the fact is that the immersion is so important to people, the actual trying out different things and coming together and the entire sort of um, the, the, the entity of IFT days the whole week. So uh, some people dropped out because they thought this is, I'm not there for this online experience. So, but on, at the other, um, on the other hand, it also opened the doors for people who could never travel uh, that far or, and, and we were happy because the, the, the ecological footprint was also uh, smaller. Yes. Exactly, excellent, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, again, also questions for you maybe at the very end. Um, I would now like to introduce our uh, last but definitely not least speaker. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Bettina Wilk. Um, she will introduce the network nature to us, um, which I believe is a perfect sort of finale of our round of, of projects on nature, health and nature-based solutions. Um, Bettina is a social scientist and senior project officer for nature-based solutions and biodiversity for ICLE in Europe. She is involved in several H2020 projects. She coordinates Network Nature, the one-stop resource for the nature-based solutions community, and has drafted guidance on co-design and collaborative governance arrangements for NBS for pro-GI-REG and Clever Cities. Prior to that, she was a researcher in environmental policy integration, urban resilience and climate adaptation with the Copernicus Institute of Sustainable Development at the Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Bettina, the stage is yours. Network Nature is a project that provides a one-stop resource for the nature-based solutions community. It gathers pertinent resources, tools, best practices and events on nature-based solutions in one place. Our aim is not only to support the existing community, but also to expand it to new target audiences, from local to global, from cities to regional scale, especially those that are not yet so engaged in the dialogue, such as public and private landowners, the finance and investment sector or society at large. Network Nature pursues six impact pathways to increase the uptake of nature-based solutions. It aims to embed them in sectoral practices, building on the benefits that they provide to these sectors. Network Nature will attend established sectoral events to pitch the value of nature-based solutions, organize dialogue events for fostering new partnerships, and develop guidance for business policy and practice. Network Nature will raise awareness with the wider public to make them recognize the benefits of nature-based solutions in their daily lives. A strong focus is on youth as future nature-based solutions leaders. We will foster local initiatives initiated by community champions through funding and set up national nature-based solutions hubs to bring research, policy, business and the public together and create long-lasting structures for their uptake. Finally, Network Nature will improve our understanding of the benefits and risks of nature-based solutions by collating and synthesizing evidence and identifying remaining knowledge gaps and needs in order to define future priorities for research and funding. Each semester, Network Nature takes an in-depth look at a key theme linked to nature-based solutions. Relevant resources from a wide range of stakeholders will be gathered and featured on the Network Nature platform to raise awareness and spur discussion. Network Nature will also attend relevant events to raise awareness about the topic and promote your work and research conducted. The first semester theme is called Nature-Based Solutions in Light of the Pandemic. Taking nature into consideration as not merely the cause of, but rather as a solution to the pandemic is crucial to help us support well-being during the ongoing pandemic and to prevent future ones. In particular, we will be looking at how human health is dependent on healthy ecosystems, how nature-based solutions can act as a buffer for the spread of zoonotic diseases, and how they can act as a vehicle for post-COVID economic recovery. Register now at networknature.eu to become part of the NBS community and benefit from greater visibility and impact of your work. As registered user, you can submit your event, upload your latest reports or findings, or feature your case study.
Thank you very much. Um, Bettina, as, as the sort of one-stop resource for NBS, uh, do you have any sort of numbers or any idea of who uses your, your platform the most? Who are the, the users? I don't know, is it practitioners or uh, policymakers? I don't know. It's mostly practitioners, I would say. So um, it's really those that usually emerge from from the consortia, you could say, as we are supposed to, you know, work as an umbrella project really to feature the work of the Horizon 2020 framework program and its projects therein. So we're kind of their shop window. So this is also the, the strongest group, actually. But we have a, a, an ambition actually to expand that community, really, especially to the finance and investment sector and also to the wider public which uh, is a tricky one I know but uh, to really expand that um, that actually there's more cross-sectoral integration of nature-based solutions so we are aiming very strong on that front. Um, I would then like to have all speakers please um, sort of on the video so that we can we have uh, just seven minutes left but a few <laughs> questions um can we have all speakers yes excellent uh, i'll go ahead with the first one uh, which is to eric um and it is um about does mapping green infrastructure and ecosystem services is that relevant in stockholm it is and even more important i would say to is to map the actual use and the benefits of said ecosystem services. We already have maps of uh, places and the green spaces where ecosystem services could potentially be generated, but there's a more limited understanding of to what extent they're actually used and whether or not they are really realized. We have a lot of theoretical, as it were, planning material, but less on the actual use and under what circumstances this potential can be accessed by different people. Okay, thank you. And I um, have just seen that I think all other questions that were posed, you have already answered in writing. Uh, let me just double check um, if there is any outstanding ones. Um, I don't know if, if any of you would like to expand on any of the questions that you have um, answered already. Yeah, I think all have been answered. Is is there anything that uh, I don't know you would you would still like to not go amiss, and that you would like to mention? Any of you? Yeah, I I just come in and say, look, the commonalities across the projects um, are striking, um, and that's a really important role. For example, for Bettina and Network Nature to amplify this voice, and thanks for giving us the opportunity to share. Our, our thoughts look individually we'll all be following up with one another and that's a measure of the impact here and uh, that's that's really interesting um i just think um one of the themes uh, we we could think about is you know nature in post covid society i'm saying that in an optimistic frame um because it was mentioned earlier about habit formation you know perhaps people have habituated to going to, to nature and you know, the research on physical activity and green space suggests that's 30 to 50 days. And we're actually in lockdown here of sorts with five kilometers. And many of you are also in lockdown. Uh, and that that has displaced our physical activity from some formal settings of gym and sport to much more opportunistic places for recreation, social interaction. And that, you know, um, the Irish word is grow, which kind of means love, but that passion for nature. Um, I think that gives us all a, a striking opportunity. Um, for example, there's probably little debate over this, you know, rush to nature, this enhanced connectivity by citizens and relationship with nature. Whereas we could debate many other things like, you know, was COVID-19 lockdown a window into carbon future? Um, so... I think it's uh, it's certainly a window into uh, a future in which we can be really connected to nature. Okay, thank you very much. 
Um, there are also two more questions in the chat. The first one is to Bettina. Um, how could practitioners and basically other H2020 NBS project partners interact with Network, Network Nature for if there are some resources and tools to share? Which is, which is a bit what I just mentioned, sharing and um, coming exactly. together. Uh, so basically network nature the platform itself similar to those that know opla the opla is also it's embedded in opla but it's re it's um, user centered so basically you can upload the resources you want to if you are a registered user so basically once you register you get your credentials and then uh, there is a section that is called nbs resources where you can upload your documents and there's basically different filters you can use. You can, for instance, indicate the project that this uh, document or this material belongs to, which is good. It gives it a greater visibility, obviously. You can also include links. You can apply additional filters in terms of what the, what the topic is, also what the target audience is and the sectors that this will be most interesting to read. So, and then it would feature in this uh, general section of NBS resources and if someone types in the filters or for example even just types in the different projects it would see, this person would see it at one glance uh, what, what there is in terms of resources we've been working quite a bit to expand that because these functions were not available on Opla yet so thanks actually for that question <laughs> yeah Excellent. thank you um, and then one question to Katrina um, can you discuss the result of 3030 uh, campaign results and how they are measured? Yes, uh, so the campaign is now running as well. So it's until the, the beginning of, uh, beginning of uh, April, basically it's running. And this year we're only doing an online diary. So all the participants get an online diary where they get to answer every day have you been moving outside? Where did you go? How natural was the area where you went to? So uh, between, I think the scale is from one to oh, zero to 10, um, completely artificial, completely natural. And it's it's completely subjective. We have, and we have absolutely no way of following whether these people actually go. So this is really, uh, it's really more um, a, uh, how do you say, um, uh, awareness raising campaign than than uh, than a study in itself. Uh, but we do previous years, we've also sent a um, three survey. So we do an impact survey of the uh, beginning, right at the, the beginning of the campaign, right after the campaign has ended, and then one month after the campaign has ended. And uh, it looks that uh, people's well-being is is improved. Uh, the problem has been though, that we've always uh, been attracting the same group. So uh, I've heard it in somebody else's presentation today that it was mostly women of uh, plus 45 years old um, and highly uh, educated. Um, that's not to say that they don't also need a support, but people really need the support and they like to see uh, their uh, how do you say the how what kind of progress that they're making this this is supporting them but um, this year we were supposed to also make a forest bathing study next to it but because in in Belgium uh, we can only meet out in groups of four people so that's going to be shifted to when when it's possible well, thank you very much I hope it, it'll be possible very soon um, we are running out of time. There is one more question to Michael, um, but um, please answer that one on, uh, in writing. You, um, it's asking for a link to your project, please. Um, I would like to thank everyone very, very, very much for your great presentations and thank you for sticking to the time. Um, it, was, it was really nice and, and inspiring to, to listen to all of your presentations and projects. Um, now I hand over to my colleague, Clive, and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the Urban Forestry Days. Thank you very much. Thank you very much also to yourself, Chris, and uh, your expert um, coordination of the last session, um, which I found really interesting. And um, we move on um, with into what is actually the final session of Urban Forestry Days. Um, a feature of the European Forum on Urban Forestry for almost all of its existence since 1998 
has been to give a shop window to people who are new to the to the field either in terms of research or practice and we didn't want that um, to suffer as a consequence of the move online and although we don't have the opportunity for so much kind of interrogation of these uh, presentations from from uh, new people young and old mainly young I think um, it um, is a feature that we wanted to maintain this year and this is it so we asked, um, we put out a call, um, I think it was about two months ago now, inviting people to submit uh, a video poster presentation. And uh, we had a good response to that. And out of that, um, uh, we selected, if I recall rightly, nine presentations. My colleagues at EFI in Bonn have very kindly uh, put these together uh, into a, a kind of a single video, uh, which we'll show in one moment. Um, please, as we go through that, if you're a delegate listening in, um, either post your comments in the Q&A um, or um, direct them to me and I will try and invite uh, some of the, and indeed I hope all of the uh, people who've submitted um, a, a video poster presentation uh, to, uh, to answer it and we can have some structured discussion at the end. I would invite you though to uh, stay to the very end. Uh, I would like also, I've been invited to make some closing remarks um, and um, some of that will I think be quite important information for you. So um, if I could uh, ask my colleagues uh, in the admin team, please would you share the video now? 